infinite. Of course, we, what all we know is that there is more of the same of a scale sufficient for us to see no effect of a change. Now, why is there this horizon when you know the universe is expanding? Since the Big Bang, it has been expanding for 14 billion years. And if you something which is at 14 billion light years from us, can just make this to us if it goes at speed of light. Light which is emitted at 14 billion light years from us will just make it to reach us. So we will, if we look at it, we will see this light at the time of the Big Bang. But anything which would be farther away from that, we could not see. So we can only see something which is within the limit of what we call our horizon. Now, as I say, but I repeat it now because it's important, the energy density of the universe is much larger than what is associated with stars and gas clouds. In fact, this is only 4%. Three quarters of it are completely explained, but well described by a cosmological constant, and we call it dark energy. So it sets a limit of the physical world, which is a limit which I have shown you, the Schwarzschild limit on which we find the black holes. Alors, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I am a... This, this sets a completely different limit, which has to do with... So, this sets... This is a limit which is here, which corresponds to the density of the universe. The density of the universe, which is completely defined by the cosmological constant. You see, lines of equal density are parallel to this line. This is atomic density in blue. This is nuclear density in green, where, of course, you find the proton, because the proton is a nucleus. But you also find neutron stars. And here, this is the density of the universe, which corresponds to the density um, associated with the cosmological constant, and which sets a new limit to the universe to the edge of, I mean, that's, if we understand nothing about uh, the, this, this domain, but if it is true that there is a cosmological constant, if it is true that it is universal, then it would set a minimum density to the world, if you want. And so the world should all be on, this, on, on the left side of this separator. So I call it the Einstein limit. Now, I introduce three basic numbers, Planck constant for the quantum world, velocity of light, and Newton gravity constant. Let's set them equal to one. Let's take them as unit. We will use them as units. Then if we do that, any quantity in the world we will, will become a pure number. So I do that, and in particular, this cosmological constant, which is linked to the density of the universe, will become a pure number. It's equal, equal to 10 to the minus 120. It's very small. I mean, it's absolutely small, because we are now in natural units, so it's small compared to 1 and we don't understand what it is due to. Now, in this natural unit, you see that the Heisenberg limit is mr equal to h bar plus equal 1. The Schwarzschild limit is r over m equal g, that is 1, I mean. So as the intersection between the two, we have r equal m equal 1. This is what we call the Planck scale. And this Planck scale corresponds to a mass of about 10 to the 19 proton masses and to a distance of about 10 to the minus 33 centimeter. Now at that scale, the physics which we use today does not work. I, will, I can explain to you very simply why. If I take an object on the Heisenberg limit, its mass by definition is 1 over L, it's 1 over its size. In, in uh, natural units. Its gravity energy is what? It's G, M, M over L. G is 1, so it's M squared over L. But of course, the gravity energy cannot be more than the mass, because the mass is made of all the energies which contain this object. 
So as soon as this m square over l will exceed 1 over l, the physics we are using today makes no sense anymore. We need a new physics. So you see that at Planck scale, gravity and quantum physics are no longer compatible. We need a new physics. And there are many, 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 many theories who are working on that. And the theory they look at is the theory where the space-time is now 11 dimensional and where the basic objects are called strings. Of course, they are at the strong scale. They have size of 10 to minus 3 centimeters. So this region here, we don't know which physics to use. The physics of quantum physics and general relativity are no longer compatible at that scale. So I can read all this just in a more elegant way to, to make, to please our aesthetic, uh, aesthetic taste. But never mind, it's a detail, so I put a Schwarzschild image here, the Heisenberg image here, and the Einstein image here, just making this trivial change of coordinates. One question we have then is what happens here at the crossing between the Einstein limit and the Heisenberg limit? It so happens that the mass here is equal to the mass of the neutrino. The neutrino is the lightest element body particle which we ever discovered. Is it by chance or is it corresponding to something deep? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Maybe it's an accident. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's indeed because this Einstein limit really sets a limit on the density of any object, of anything. Okay, so this justifies the title I gave to the talk, if you want. It's a summary of the general picture which we have to take of the world. The quantum world image here, the gravitation image here, and the crossing, the Planck scale where we don't understand physics. Here, the base of the heart is the Einstein image which we do not understand. And the crossing between the two is a universe which is dominated by this dark energy which we don't understand. And that's a crossing between the two here, we have the neutrino. And the scale of that, there is only one scale which tells you how high the heart is, and is given by the cosmological constant, which is lambda equal 10 to the minus 120. So where does the Higgs boson fit in such a picture? See, I could have started talking about the Higgs boson, but it would not have been fair. I mean, this, I told you about the general picture we have to use of the world. Where does the Higgs boson fit there? Well, to answer that, we have to look in more details. If we look in more details, it reveals many new unanswered questions, many new puzzles. At large distance, we have two major puzzles. One is called dark matter, the other is called inflation. I will not talk about them because I am not coming. And the Higgs boson, anyhow, it's not when we look in more detail at large distance, but when we look into more details at small distances. Let me just tell you that dark matter is something which is present in galaxies and cluster of galaxies and accounts for nearly a quarter of the energy density of the universe. We have some idea, it's, it's less strange than dark energy. So we have some idea of what it could be. But we don't know. And inflation is a very rapid expansion that must have taken place just after the Big Bang, an exponential expansion. But we are unable, we have a lot of ideas about it because it explains a lot of things. But we are not able to describe it precisely. We don't have a good model of inflation. But I'm sorry, I cannot talk about that. I want to switch now to the Higgs boson. And the Higgs boson appears when we look at small distances. So the first thing to understand, to realize, is that the most massive elementary particles which we know of, which are the weak bosons, they are 80 and 91 GV. GV is one proton mass, roughly. Okay, so that's 80 and 90 proton mass. The Higgs boson of today, which is under 26 G, and the heaviest of all particles, which we call the top quark, which is under 73 G. All this is peanuts compared to the Planck mass 
not much is 10 to the 19. So they are masses in the 10 to the minus 9, 17 ballpark when expressing natural units. There is no other scale in the universe. So we have particles in this which have ridiculously small masses, 10 to the minus 17 in natural units. So it is legitimate to hope that the theory of massless particles would be a good approximation to the real world. And indeed it is, it is. It is, and we call it the standard problem of massless particles. And it is amazingly simple, elegant, and successful. And I have to tell you a little bit about that if you want to understand where the Higgs comes in. The problem is that this beautiful theory of massless particles does not tolerate any mass. As soon as you assume that there is a small mass in this model, then it blows up, if you want, by interaction, and the theory collapses. So you would say, who cares, 10 to the minus 17, blah, 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 but still we are living in a world where masses are important, so you want to be able to put masses in the theory. You cannot just ignore that. And the only way to do it in a simple and elegant way was the Higgs mechanism. That's why we devoted so much effort to search for this Higgs boson. So, what is a standard model of massless particles? It's, you start with three fermions. Fermions are spin one half elementary particles. Essentially, they are the quarks of which the protons and the neutrons of atomic nuclei are made, and they are leptons, and the most famous, if you want, is the electron. So atoms are made of these fermions, quarks and electrons, but the neutrino is another electron, which is in fact the little brother of the electron, or sister, I don't know which sex of these things is. Now, you start with that, and you simply impose some group symmetries, and also gauge in that. And if you do that, I will explain this in the two next slides. If you just do that, you must, you, you generate, if you want, you must have a new particle, which is a spin one particle. It, this means if I take the case of uh, the symmetry which corresponds to electromagnetism, then if I take an electric charge particle, then I find that there must be light, there must be a photon. I don't need to inject the photon in my theory. The photon is a result of imposing a symmetry to my electronic inter electromagnetic interaction and to imposing the aging balance. Not only it generates the photon for me, but it tells me how this photon must be coupled to the fermions I started with and also eventually among themselves. So that's what makes this theory so beautiful because it's based on ideas which are very elegant and which sound to us very universal, symmetries in values. <coughs> so first ingredient is a symmetries. And we are talking of symmetries with respect to transformations which are the group structure. Again, she's a that's again a place where mathematicians and physicists work hand in hand. The concepts of mathematics like Lie groups, which are central to the understanding which we have of these things. But so we have symmetry of space, and that's what we call the, it's SL2C in group uh, language. It's what we call the Poincaré group, and it is made of the translations in space and time the rotation in space, and the Lorentz transformation, which has the rotation between space and time. And then we have excel symmetries. Excel symmetry is to say we take two fermions and of different types, but if I excel them, I, it has no effect on the world. The, the theory is still, the world is still behaving the same way. And again, I assume that they exist after group structure, and in fact, electromagnetics will be de described by U of 1, you just phase. Weak interaction is, called by, is defined by SU2, that's a spin 1 half, and strong interaction is described by SU3 
which is a bit long in first. So here we need the concept, a group of infinitesimal transform. I am I realize that some of you have no idea of what I am talking about now. I don't like to see any equation or any mathematical variable. They have to be patient and I will soon come back on Earth. <laughs> so but let me just mention that because if you want to understand the Higgs mechanism, you need to understand a little bit his ideas. So a group of infinitesimal transformation will transform a state psi into one plus something small, which is lambda x times psi. And this lambda is an operator which is called the infinitesimal generator of the group. And when the commutators decrease this infinity, the infinitesimal generators can be expressed vectorially, if you want, as a linear combination of the, of each other, then you have what is called a deep group, and then you have things here which are called the structure constants of the group. So the second ingredient, I say, is gauge invariance. What is it? Physics sometimes depends on things which are redundant. For example, in quantum physics, a quantum state has a phase. If at the same point of space-time I want to add, say, two quantum states, then what matters is the relative phase between these two states, but not their absolute phase. I can change the absolute phase I give to any quantum state at a given point of space-time as I wish. So it's nice to express that in the theory. You know, you don't like to carry variables which have no meaning, which are redundant. And when you express that, you get what's at first to state that, is to state that you have gauge invariance. And now gauge invariance plus group symmetry, if you combine the two, is the main effect that it will change the derivatives of the field into what we call covariant derivatives. Now the derivatives, they appear in the kinetic energy. In the kinetic energy. So what happens is that you will have now a new term which comes here, which has these forms. These are the infinity generators, and this VK here correspond to vector 1, bosons, massless bosons. So by imposing gauge invariance and U of one symmetry on electromagnetic, you get the photon. If you impose SU2 left and uh, uh, gauge invariance plus SU2 left on the weak interaction, you will get the W plus minus and the Z, the weak bosons. If you do that on uh, the strong interaction with SU3 here, you will get eight new vector bosons, massless, we call them the gluons, and they are the mediators of the strong interaction. So this VK, they are good gauge, we call them gauge bosons because they are generated by gauge invariance. They are massless just because there is no mass term which appears in the black angle. You know, we, can, we, we simply express gauge invariance and we see new terms and we look and we see no mass terms, there is no mass terms. These gauge bosons are massless. They are massless. They are coupled to the original particles very simply. See, that's the boson, it's coupled to the original particles, it's called the current, via one number, which is called the coupling constant. And possibly, they may be coupled to themselves via the commutators. So you see, SU1, for example, is Armenian, there is no commutator, there is just one photon. The photon does not interact with itself. SU3, which is non abelian it has commutators, and the gluons interact with themselves in a very well-defined way. <coughs> so, the massless vector gauge bosons of U of 1 and SU3, they exist in nature, they have the photon and the gluons, and they behave as they should, the photon for U of 1, the A gluons for SU3. But the gauge bosons of SU2, the ZW plus and W minus 
who read the results, they also exist in nature. And it was a big step forward to find them, to discover them in the early 80s. But they are not massless. They are massive. Their mass is 10 to the minus 17. It's peanuts, but still, it's large compared to a photon mass. It's 100 photon masses. So that's a problem. But moreover, SU2 symmetry is not exact. For example, the mass of an electron and the mass of a neutrino are not the same. So the eight gluons, they are massless, they behave exactly the same way. The photon is alone. So SU of 1 and SU3 are not broken at all, but SU2 is broken, is broken, and the vector bosons of which appear when we impose gauge invariance on SU2, the are not massless. So it's a natural idea if you want, I mean I don't don't take this, I don't mean X as a uh, it was trivial to have the idea, but it's a relatively natural idea to relate the two and to find for them the common explanation, the common explanation for the fact that the masses are not zero and for the fact that SUT is slightly broken. <laughs> okay, so the combination of gauge invariance with Goldstone theorem does the job, and this is a broad angular Higgs mass integration mechanism. So, Two more slides to suffer, and then I will go to. But here they are, these people. X is not on this picture. They all received also X, the Sakurai Prize in 2010. And you see here Kibble, Uwani, Hagen. That was one group. Uh, François Englert and Groups, that was another group. And Peter X was alone. You see here. You will see again at the end of the talk, together with François Englert. This is on July 4th when the bosom was announced at seven. I like this picture with the hands. <laughs> okay, so a little bit more patience and then I will be through with that part of the talk. I want to explain to you what is a Goldstone boson, or at least to give you an idea. You see, I start with two scalar particles, they have no spin. And they, but they have the same mass, so I can describe them by a given state vector field, if you want, for, for what I say here is the same, which will be the real part of the state vector and the imaginary part. And I assume that they interact by a potential which has this form. You see, rho square, rho square minus v square, v is a constant. And rho is simplified square. So you see, this potential as a function of rho square, it's zero for rho squared equals zero. It's zero for rho squared equals v squared. It's minimum for, uh, this, for rho squared equals v squared over two, or rho equals v over two. If you plot this as a function of real phi and imaginary phi, well, these angles here get round, so you get a kind of uh, uh, Mexican hat shape, and you see that you have a ground state here, corresponding to V over root 2, which is degenerate. The fake, I mean, all the ground states on this circle have the same energy. But nature will choose one ground state, it cannot be two ground states at the same time, you have to choose one. So nature chooses one ground state, and then, of course, the world appears not to be symmetric anymore with respect to its U of 1, with its rotation, around this axis of phi equals zero. But here, you don't have this symmetry anymore. So the symmetry, it looks like it has been broken. It's something very general in physics. You see, if I take this thing here, it's, it looks, it is in unstable equilibrium. It may fall like that, or it may fall like that. It may fall like that. All these ground states are the same energy. They are degenerate that they correspond to different states. That's what we call spontaneous symmetry breaking. It's not really a violation of the symmetry, it's just making the choice of a particular ground state. But then if we rewrite our Lagrangian no longer as a function of phi, but as a function of coordinates which are around the chosen minimum, that's what I do here. You see. This is a circle I look from top, that's a circle of minimum, real phi, imaginary phi, and now I divide my Lagrangian harmonia. 
who is V over two. This means I know eta is imaginary phi, but real phi is now psi plus V over root two. And if I do that, if I do that, I have no longer, I have a term in psi square. So this means the particle associated with psi will have a mass, the mass V over V over two. But I have no term in it at the ground state, so we freeze the degree of freedom and we generate, we generate a massless boson, that's Boris von Bodov, which was really the first person to understand that was Nambu, not at all in this context, it was in the context of the BCF theory of superconductivity, which has been a very rich uh, terrain for physicists well before all that, all that time. Now, this is the last slide I have to suffer. If I now impose late local gauge invariance on such a spontaneous specific problem uh, symmetry, uh, as I told you, I will change my derivatives in covariant derivatives which contain the vector boson. And so when I write the kinetic energy, and if I replace my phi phi by its expression as a function of eta squared and psi squared, I find a term here which is v nu v nu v squared. That's a constant, and this is the vector boson squared. So it is a mass term for the vector boson. It is a mass term for the vector boson. So by imposing gain, gauge invariance on a spontaneously broken uh, group symmetry, I have generated a mass to my formerly massless vector bosons. So, gauge invariance gives you massless gauge bosons. Spontaneous symmetry breaking gives you massless Goldstein bosons. But the two together, they give you massive gauge bosons. So, this is the Higgs mechanism. So, if I summarize it, we started with two particles of equal masses. We introduced a potential causing spontaneous symmetry breaking, and we were left with a massive particle, psi and the massless Goldstone bond on eta. Requiring local gauge invariance under the symmetry having V as gauge bosons makes V become massive. And then we choose a gauge where phi, the X boson is real, eta equals zero. And this is a root angle of this mass generation mechanism. So the X boson is therefore a very elegant way to describe at the same time the slight breaking of a two symmetry of the electronic symmetry and the fact that the electronic bosons are masses. And what we find is that the electric spot, the X boson is a scalar. It has no spin. But when we look now at all the terms we have generated in our Lagrange, we see that it interacts with all particles in proportion to their mass. So that's a very nice solution. It's a way to generate mass to all the particles. And so this is a picture we have now with the standard model. We have the left, three leptons which we started with, which are what we call leptons with the electron, and quarks with up and down, which makes a quarter and neutron. Then we have the gauge bosons, which we generated by imposing gauge invariance. The photon with U of, with U of 1 the weak bosons with SU2, and the gluons with SU3. And in addition, we have a scalar particle, the X boson, which accounts for both symmetry breaking of SU2 or SU1, and for the fact that all particles have mass, and it interacts with all particles having mass, and with itself. The gluons also interact with themselves, because it's a non abelian theory, while the photon, the, the photon does not interact with itself, because it's a uh, Avenian theory. So the root angular tricks mass generation mechanism predicts the existence of at least, I say at least because I can make it more complicated, it's very easy, instead of starting with one pair of, uh, of what will become the Higgs boson, I can start with more. And it so happens that there are good reasons to do that, I don't explain why now. So it's at least. At least one elementary scalar neutral boson having the property of interacting with all particles in proportion to their matters. 
It's much, it's not from Shikhaim. The theory does not tell us anything about the mass of this explosion. It's unfortunate. Apart from being in the ballpark of the physics we talk about here, we say it's between 100 GV and 1000 GV, it's given by the mass of the weak explosion. So, and the need to be the collider able to produce the least boson in this mass window. We don't want to produce a collider which is a bit too short in energy, so which will miss the least boson because it doesn't have enough energy. And this is what we call the large atom collider. And 30 years ago, it was clear to us that we had, that was the next step we had to build such a collider so we could produce the Higgs boson, and whatever physics is associated with phenomena at that scale, which is a scale of SU2 symmetry breaking. Okay, so now I go back to Earth, for those of you who did not uh, how much time is left? So how to build such a machine? There are not many choices. One choice is whether you want to have the, uh, electrons or photons. You could accelerate things like muons or anti photons, but they are very difficult to produce, you cannot produce many, and since the probability to produce a X is very low, you want to have very intense beams in your collider. So, what one wants to forget about anti photons or muons or things like that, one has to stick to what exists in atoms, which are Photons, when well, neutrons, they are neutrons, you cannot accelerate them. Photons are electrons. The choice between photons and electrons is not trivial. Electrons are nice because they are elementary particles, but they are very light. They are 2,000 times lighter than photons. And when you bend them, they emit light. That's what is called synchrotron radiation. It's used by many, many people now in solid state physics, in industry in biophysics, like a microscope, you know, there are many uh, synchrotron sources around the world. There is one in Taiwan, one in Korea, I think, in Japan, I mean, it's many, many countries are important synchrotron sources. But that's fine for them, but it's not good for us, because if you bend an electron, it will emit light, and so it will lose energy. So you have to keep giving it more energy. Now, the so way out is to have a linear, linear accelerator. So electrons you could make as linear accelerators. But then you lose the great advantage of circular accelerator. What's good in a circular accelerator? That the same particle will pass millions of time through the same accelerating cavity. So you need to give maybe only 100 MV each time to the particle. After one million passage, it will have 100 million MeV, which is 100 TV. That's a lot. So, with a circular accelerator, you accelerate the particles step by step. With a linear accelerator, you cannot. Particles pass only once in the cavity. So, you need very long lines and very many cavities. You need no magnet because you go straight, or at least just to focalize the field. The other choice is photons. Photons, they are much more heavier. So if you bend them, they will not have too much synchrotron radiation. That's all right. So you don't need to spend too much money in accelerating cavity, but you have to bend them. And if you want to, let's say, stay on a circle. And for this, you need magnets. And at this energy, you need very strong magnets. In fact, normal magnets will not do the job. You need superconducting magnets. Another inconvenient of